We were talking about the costs and benefits of property-oriented capitalism in the UK earlier. How about talking about the Indian version of that? The writer, Arundhati Roy, is with me. She won the Booker Prize back in the 90s for The God of Small Things, but she's now more interested in big things, poverty, inequality, repression. She's written a scathing attack on uh, India's capitalist economy. Uh, here it is. It starts with a particular piece of real estate. So take a look at this. It's not an office block, it's a house in Mumbai. 27 floors, six devoted to parking. It has three helipads and belongs to India's richest man, Mukesh Ambani. It's certainly a statement. But in the middle of such a poor city in a poor country with so many homeless, what is the statement exactly saying? The writer Arundhati Roy asks, is this the final act of the most successful secessionist movement in India, the secession of the middle and upper classes into outer space. The rise of India's new rich goes back to 1991, when the country took a new economic direction, a more liberal one, a step to the free market orthodoxy fashionable at the time. That change has had a positive material effect on the lives of many. The per capita growth rate of the country has jumped, it's not been as economically successful as China, but it has become a global player. Indian companies have even taken over jewels in the British industrial crown, like Jaguar Land Rover. But it's not helped everyone back home. Arundhati Roy is one of the most scathing critics of that Western model of globalised capitalism. She says the 300 million of us who belong to the new middle class live side by side with spirits of the netherworld, the poltergeists of dead rivers, dry wells, bald mountains and denuded forests, the ghosts of 250,000 debt-ridden farmers who've killed themselves, and of the 800 million who've been impoverished and dispossessed to make way for us. Arundhati Roy is with me now. Thank you for coming in. And I, I mean, you recognise it took a very different turn in 1991, right, India? And it did improve it did. the growth rate, yes? Yes, yes, it did. It did. The, the, the thing is that now, you know, what do we mean when it, we even use the word India? You know, who is India? Um, the growth rate did gallop, but you, you, it came at such a cost. I mean, if, if very many million were pushed into the middle class, but many more were pushed into the underclass, away from the light. Uh, so we don't know uh, that story. It's not told. Well, it's, it's very important to distinguish. Were they actually were people made poorer by the arrival, if you like, of a middle and upper class? Or did they simply get left out? Because there's a big difference between yes. their life just carrying on mm. and they, they weren't helped, but, uh, and then being pushed further down. Yes, I think, you know, I mean, you see, the thing is, if you look at statistics, the people fool around with the poverty line. You know, it's not that people get richer and poorer, but the poverty line moves around. But when you look at things like food grain intake, you see they've actually got poorer, you know? And so that is really the problem that's you facing know, us. Was, uh, it used to be the case that something like, in um, 2006, I was talking to the Global Nutrition uh, Report folks today, who really have worked quite hard on measuring these things, and they don't have a poverty line in terms of mm. how many rupees can you get a day, and they said that in 2006, 48% of Indian children under five were stunted. Yes. And that's gone down since then to about 37%. Now that is quite, they said, mm. that's quite a big quite a big improvement. The Global Hunger Index, which is a way of measuring, it's not poverty, it's measuring hunger, it's basically. Measuring hunger, yeah. And, and mm. that's come down very substantially. Why would that have come, why would that have improved so markedly if things were getting so much worse for the poor of India? Um, I think, you know, there are so many different factors that you would take into account, but I'm not aware of this, you know, that it has improved, but I, somehow I don't, I don't know now, there are so many figures that, that, that float around, you know, and you, you don't know which ones to trust. But what you do see is a situation in India where increasingly, um, because of displacement, because of 
dispossession because of uh, you know what is known as underemployment which doesn't mm. figure really you know have 90% of of the labor force in in the unorganized sector there's so much violence that it has to be put down by the paramilitary by the police by laws that are crazy you know people are in jail so you can't i don't think you can you can argue that you know things are getting better for the mass of people right. because they they need to be disciplined by sheer brute force by violence now mm. and these policies can only be implemented with violence now mm. you know? i mean what one interesting thing of course is that if you're book on capitalism was right, your critique of capitalism was right, it wouldn't have worked in China. Do you think it has worked in China? Because most people would look at China and say it's been a remarkable story that has, has trickled down to, not to everybody, but yeah. to a very large number. Well, there are two, I mean, there's one very important thing about the difference between India and China. You know, we all know the price that the Chinese paid for the revolution, mm. but there was a revolution and that involved everyone getting an education an equal education in in the in a similar school for example you know in india you have a situation where that never happened i mean i'm not i'm not saying that millions didn't pay the price in china they did but in india you have a, a situation where you have this growth rate as you mentioned but it's it's what we call a jobless growth rate right so the the wealth is being concentrated in fewer and fewer and fewer hands and then they turn it into forms of charity work or ngos you know so there's a structural problem and even what you know in india now for example i mean you showed the 27 story building you, you know if you knew what mukesh ambani as one of the handful of corporates controls, you know, mines, ports, special economic zones, colleges, um, petrochemicals, everything, plus 27 national TV channels. The media, too, is controlled by these mm. corporations. By the way, I mean, all, almost all of them belong to a particular caste you know, the trader cast. Well, look, uh, let's move on from the economy, because mm. we, could, we could talk all, all, all night yeah. about that and, and, and people will have their own views. The, you, you've also written quite a lot, and you've written an introduction to another book called Annihilation of Caste, which is a reprint of a book from many decades ago um, about the treatment of the Dalits, the untouchables, and in particular about the role of Gandhi in really in trying not to shake up the hierarchy that existed. And you've really reviewed your position on Gandhi altogether, haven't you? I'm quite surprised. I was, yeah, well, I was surprised too, because uh, when I started to write uh, th this book, Annihilation of Caste, was published in 1936 by uh, Ambedkar, Dr. Ambedkar, who was born into an untouchable uh, family and uh, grew to be Gandhi's greatest adversary morally psych, uh, you know and politically and in every way ethically and um, so i started to put, uh, you know follow this argument between gandhi and ambedkar back into the past into uh, just following the thread of caste and then taking it back into south africa where gandhi uh, you know played a terrible role and uh, and and is held up as a mahatma and i i of course know that you can't say these things about Gandhi. I haven't said anything. I've just reproduced his own writing from 1893 mm. up to 1948. And the things he says about black people, about workers, about women, about Dalits in particular. He's known as someone who campaigned against untouchability, which we must remember is the performative and ritual end of caste. But he believed in caste he said it was the genius of hindu society that everyone should 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 pursue their hereditary and god-given we opportunity we've got so much to talk about and we've got so little time i, I, I mean the, india has big issues obviously and it's a very big country i did want to just finish on the role of women because many of us were surprised uh, two years ago when the, the the whole issue of rape and the treatment of women was exploded into the global eye and then in more recent weeks, we've had this <coughs> astonishing case of finding out how many women in, Italy, uh, in India are, are sterilized. And it, it, it's over a third of women are sterilized. Is that, 
Is there coercion there? Is it voluntary? Is that what women want? Is that an expression of their choice? Well, let's start with uh, female feticide. You know, first of all, more than a million girl children are, are murdered before they are born. Then they are murdered after they are born by their own parents, right? And then there is all this sterilization which has happened because actually in, in 1977 there was a huge scandal during the emergency where they were sterilizing the men. So now they've given up that and they're forcibly sterilizing women and many, Forcibly many, or voluntarily? I mean, they, you know, in a, in a country with poverty of that level, you're saying, in the papers you would have read, they were saying, we'll give you some eggs and bread and, you know, for, and they didn't even get that, you know. And they, and, they, and, they, and they died on the, uh, on the uh, operation table. And uh, you have, of course, I mean, everybody, everybody talks mm -hmm. about the December, uh, the, the rape and gang rape and murder on the bus. They forget that in Gujarat, when our current prime minister was the chief minister, he oversaw a pogrom. He presided over a pogrom in which thousands of women were gang raped and murdered on the streets of Gujarat. We have barely touched the issues. Aaron Dutty Roy, thank you so much You're for coming welcome. here. You're Thanks welcome. very much. Thanks.